Hello and welcome to the Transformational Speakers Podcast. I'm your host, Erin Lomanjek, and today we are going to be talking about vocals. I love this. It's so exciting. It's one of my favorite pieces that I have been discovering more of in the last year about how to use your voice in a way that deeply connects with the audience, but also how do we even use our voice? What's the, the main components of that and how can we use it as an instrument? So today I'm bringing to you Robert, who is the owner and founder of The Vocalist Studio, an internationally recognized voice training school for singing, vocal techniques, public speaking, voice consulting, and the advanced the Vocalist Studio Certification Program for Voice Teachers. Robert is the author and producer of the acclaimed vocal instruction training course and book, The Four Pillars of Singing. Woo woo! There it is. Robert Lenti helps singers and voice teachers learn how to build strength, motor skills, coordination that takes their vocal and performance skills to the next level using the highly acclaimed TVS method. Vocal coaches and students who attend Robert's trainings learn proven methodology, which gives them the knowledge and skills to offer and sustain an effective and successful singing voice and training practice. Robert and his sponsors have hosted over 65 master vocal master classes in over 12 countries. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm super excited to have you here today so that we can learn how to use our, our instrument. Like you said, play the instrument that you were given. Yeah. So welcome. Yeah. Hey, um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, gosh, that's quite an introduction. Um, <laughs> I, I do appreciate that. And it's just been so fun uh, uh, getting to know you in the last few weeks. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to, to you and, of course, your listeners. And, uh, yeah, if you guys want to know about how the voice works, how to train the voice, how to get healthier as a singer or as a public speaker, I got some ideas for you. I'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah. I love that. I'm excited. Okay. So, right. Robert, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you become uh, this guy? Mm, okay. Well, um, I was a kid from the 80s that just loved good sort of heavy metal, extravagant, extreme screaming singing. Uh, remember, just a, you know, Queen's Reich, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Journey. I was one of those guys. It drove my, my parents absolutely crazy. Um, I loved this singing so much and this, this way of using the voice so much that, that it was, I guess that's for the spark that, that inspired me to then seek training. Um, I uh, eventually found a, uh, a famous voice coach here in Seattle, Washington. A lot of people from Seattle are familiar with him. His name was Maestro David Kyle, Maestro David Kyle. He's passed away in 2004, but he was a very famous voice coach up here. He taught um, Ann Wilson from Heart, Lane Staley from Allison Chains, Chris Cornell, Jeff Tate from uh, Queensryche, myself, and lots of really fantastic singers from um, uh, that maybe never even heard of. Trained for about 12 years. I'm going as fast as I can. And I just really geeked out and loved. Um, I, I, I've always had a fetish for singing high notes and sort of a pseudo new age operatic vibe to it with complete control and power. There's something when it's done right, there's something sort of heroic or even masculine about it that really gets me off and it's really fascinates me. So not only as a singer and somebody that tries to do that as much as I possibly can, I dedicated my life to learning the techniques to bridge the vocal break, and sing high in the head voice and make what used to be for most people sort of huh, kind of a light falsetto sound, sound full, beefy and boomy. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of training. Um, then I wrote this book, The Four Pillars of Singing, on this is the fifth edition. It's been about eight years since I wrote the first edition. With this book is literally the world's most comprehensive online vocal technique training program available. So if you're a singer, and you want to train and practice, you might, you might know who I am. You may have had my program. It's done, it's done well. It's helped a lot of singers on about 147 countries around the planet. Um, add to that master classes, speaking events, teacher training, and sponsors, microphone sponsors, just everything you can possibly do to get out and reach more singers and help more voices and have fun doing it. I, gosh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I love it. I know that you probably didn't seek out to be a vocal coach, right? That's uh, kind of what we fall into, right? That's, you know, that's a great question. Um, 
I didn't, I, I'm a great case study for the guy that sort of latched on to the thing that found me. Um, I guess there's sort of situational awareness that's required at certain points in your life when, when you're doing something that, that, that you're so good at based on the results you're getting and the feedback you're getting that you just sort of realize, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw in the towel in the corporate world and go full, full bore on this, uh, write a book, do a course, get after it. That's what I did. I did not set out to be a voice coach. This was not my plan. I've had corporate jobs. I'd worked for 12 years as an IT tech sales guy. Did okay with that, but I just could not deny the fact that I can't lose and stop hitting home runs as a vocal coach. And so at some point, about eight years ago, not 10 years ago, I embraced it and, and went after it. Yeah, yeah, it found me. It, it, it tapped me, and then I just sort of listened and went with it. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree with that. I didn't set out to be a speaking coach either. I was a business coach yeah. and literally on my drive to the world's greatest speaking training, I heard the big building voice that said, get in your lane. And I thought, I'm in my lane and I'm looking around in traffic. Like, <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm in my lane. And I remember the voice speaking back to me and saying, no, the lane that was created for you. I've been creating this for you your whole life. And I thought, but I don't know. I don't, I didn't do any formal presentations or speaking or uh, theater practice or singing. I didn't do any of that. So why me? But like you, I was doing it and everyone was asking, oh my gosh, I see you everywhere. How do you do this? How do you get on all these stages? How do you be so captivating in what you do? And I was like, hmm. And now looking back, I can see that I was dancing on stages at two years old and competing. I mean, you start looking, my first talk, 10 years old at my dad's funeral, but it just, my whole life has been built towards this. I just didn't see it coming. Right, yeah. But when, when you realize you're in it, you kind of know, like, because it's really, it's sort of easy, certainly compared to anything else that you're doing. It's just it's very natural and very intuitive when you've found your thing. It's, I think the important piece on this, when, if and when you have the opportunity for this to happen for some folks, is situational awareness. Being able to step back and look at what's going on and the results that are, that are happening around you, be aware of it, and, and just have the ability to be awake enough to say, gosh, you know, over here I'm struggling and trying to get sales or whatever it is I'm trying to do in my day job or whatever it is I'm trying to do over here, it's, it's only okay or it's not working, but over here things are really smooth and I can't lose and it feels intuitive. And I've never been really particularly trained to do that job, but I somehow intuitively know what to do and what I do is good. <laughs> if you find yourself in that situation, antennas up, listen closely, because that's, that's life signaling at you to pay attention. Yeah, for sure. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I learned so early was, you know, I have this story about hearing my mom and my grandma say that it was painful to look at me when I was 10 because I look like my father. So my 10 year old self thought, man, I just need to make everyone feel good. And if I make everyone feel good, then I'll be good enough. And so what I learned to do was start to watch people's body language, their facial expressions. I could feel their emotions. So I heightened all those awarenesses. And then fast forward, coaching softball and volleyball, I'm all about watching someone's form. And I can see the slightest thing that's turning you, that's turning you the wrong way or whatever that is, it's not effective. And now with what I do on stage, it's the same thing. I can read your psychology of what's going on for you based on your physicality and your facial expression. So I think you're right. Like you fall into it and then you see all these things that you've been kind of building along the way, not knowing they're your superpowers and then being able to go, oh yeah, that's why I can see that stuff, right? Yeah, something like that. I, I don't have all the I, I don't have all the answers. I just know this is just the way I'm paying my bills and I'm really good at it and people keep coming back. So I'll just keep doing it. 
So I love that one thing you always talk about when we, we have conversations is about how you see voice as colors. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I love that that's a unique way. And I know that there's actually a psychology thing about people who actually see music in color. Sure. So in vocal training technique, um, be it a singer or public speakers, um, one of the challenges that we have is you can't, see sound. It's not readily easy to see sound. Now there are spectrograph software and actually a sort of a color coded innovation inside my book. Certain few exceptions where you can see representations of sound, but as a general rule, you can't do it. So, so what we, so that makes learning and attaining the, um, the tech uh, 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 retention of what you're learning more abstract and more difficult. Now, if we can get the eyes involved, though, if you because eyes are very powerful information gathering organs, um, maybe they're the most powerful. If you can get the eyes involved, so you can actually somehow, with a tool or an application or colors in a book like mine, to see vowels, then what happens is we have the ability to understand much easier what is truly the most abstract and most difficult concept in vocal training to grasp, and that is acoustics, resonance, and performance. It's, it's sort of the, the super hard calculus piece of vocal technique. So we try to get our eyes involved with spectrograph software and colors. Now, in my training program, I have identified 10 vowels or sound colors. Now, when I say vowels, I don't mean linguistic vowels. I don't mean the vowels in my book. I don't mean A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Not the real vowels. The, um, when we talk about vowels in public speaking uh, training and singing training, we're really using it as a metaphor for sound colors. I'll make my point. This is five language vowels. We've heard them before. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And, and I did that perfect. This is five singing vowels or sound colors. A, I, O, U, R, A, U. Six or seven sound colors. That's what we mean by sound colors. And truly, it is a sound color, and when you begin to hear the vowels as sound colors, what do you do with that? Forward, amplified, and animated resonance for public speaking and singing, as well as pitch, sing, uh, singing and speaking higher for, to excite, to add excitement to your speech, and low. A big part of doing that in a way that will keep the voice animated, amplified, and not tired is by turning, changing the vowel colors, right? By modifying. See, that's a modification of my singing vowel or my speaking vowel or a sound color. Playing with those color hues as we sing and as we speak, moves the resonance. The sound colors are like a steering wheel that move the resonance. So for speaking, public speaking clients, we want them to speak more forward in the hard palate and not swallow the resonance down here in the throat. We want to be up here, brighter, being kind of pinging off the teeth in the upper hard palate. So one way we would do that is we would train certain techniques in my program that allows people to shade their speech with a slight color that they and I would be aware of, but the listener really wouldn't be aware of. Just enough to shift and move that resonance to a healthier, more amplified, animated position. Gosh, does that make sense? I mean, yeah. you asked me a question on the most complicated thing in singing uh. technique. <laughs> of course, because I want to learn the advanced techniques, right? Yeah. We're no novice here. No, I love that because I think a lot of times people just go, well, I just speak. This is my normal voice. And what I always say is, you know, we're all resonating at the same level most of the time. And we're bored out of our minds from listening to one another. If you feel like you know what the person is going to say next, you become a predictable 
they check out, take their, their phone out and start scrolling. They're no longer listening to you. But if you can use different techniques to go up in your tone, down in your tone, use those different resonance and different places, then people don't feel like you're predictable. And when you're not predictable, they're listening. They're captivated. Like, what's next going to come out of her mouth, right? And yeah. I think people don't know that. Well, and that's when, when you begin to add that prosody that you're referring to and that interpretation and, and dynamics in color and in pitch and frequency um, and excitement and even dramatic pause. Um, when you... When you begin to, to, to do those things, you begin to then play an instrument. Truly, I'm not trying to be coy and cute with some uh, really, when you've got dynamics, pitch, colors that you're playing with, you're really working with an instrument. And that's what I certainly do for singers, but I'm also doing for public speakers. And I'm more and more just, uh, I'm excited to help public speakers with the same techniques I've been using with seniors. And I'm just super excited to get into that and <laughs> help more and more people. Yeah. So yeah. what would be the most important tip for speakers to know how to take care of their voice or even notice that they need to start working on it? Um, a couple things. One, you need content, training content to warm up and literally get the the tissue, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments moving inside the larynx system, the vocal folds moving, um, um, an athletic training routine, which I can provide. Um, but in addition to just the facilities, the content, uh, most people, most people resonate down here in sort of a dopey, woofy, swallowed throat resonance position down here. And one, it sounds sort of dopey. And two, it's very fatiguing and not healthy. Okay. So, just being aware of that. Be aware that you're sort of a dopey throat, throat speaker. And if you are, don't freak out. Don't, don't, don't throw a fit because most people are. Right? <laughs> um, the training helps you to lift your resonance. So um, without going into too much uh, uh, complexity, that would be the first thing. It's be aware of where you're resonating. Okay? And most people are resonating in the throat. And you want to lift that and get it more forward in the palate, kind of like how I'm speaking. This, the resonance and the energy in my speaking voice is in part due to all the training that I've had. Um, and you can see how it's sort, of, it's sort of bright and it's sort of masky and forward and animated. Um, it's not down here and sort of dopey and throaty. Now, this may be really <laughs> sexy and great for a date, but, it, but it's not. I don't know it's if that'd not, be great for a date. It sounds no, pretty dopey. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it'd be creepy. I don't know. Yeah. Aaron, Aaron can tell us. But if you're public speaking and you want to command people's attention, you want to get up here. Resonance. Okay. Two, the other thing is we need to do workouts that help people learn to get vocal fold compression. What I mean by that is left vocal fold, right vocal fold compressing at a healthier um, more responsive and more um, um, uh, 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 more efficient way than what we get in speech. Listen, speech is a lazy vocal mode. It's a lazy position uh, for most people. And so when you start the training and the routines, you end up kind of turning, getting your, getting your speaking voice off the couch and running around the track and moving and getting healthy again. So resonance and waking up the musculature involved to get better compression on the vocal folds so that you can um, amplify your resonance better. Now, there's a lot more to it, but those would probably be the first two things that you'd be working on with most public speakers to make them speak in a more exciting and interesting way. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I do my vocal warmups every morning. I do them in the car as I'm going to a, a talk. I make sure like that's what I do. If I'm going to sit here and do podcasts, I did my vocal warmup this morning, you know, and what you start doing is even if you don't know what you're doing, you start to see that when, when you're le when you're being led through a, a scale, right? You hear the different sounds that your voice can make that you yeah. normally don't make. So then you start to feel what it feels like inside your throat on how different sounds are. Because like I say, most of us as humans have about three. Our main talking voice, that's the normal voice that we use every day. Then a baby comes crawling in and you're like, oh my gosh, hey baby, we go really high. And then we tell them they're in trouble and we want to yell at them. No. 
So that's it. As humans, that's how we're communicating and we're all bored with each other. <laughs> so if you can learn to feel that there's different stages and different levels in your voice, different, you know, pitches, tones, all of those things, you start to be able to play it and yes. master it yeah. and start to really take people on that journey, yes. right? As you right. walk up the stairs or walk down the stairs, all of those things can elicit emotions in people based uh -huh. on those sounds. And so the resonance, you feel the vibration, but then you're like, ooh, she's getting really quiet right now. She's about to tell us a secret, yeah. right? So you bring yeah. them in. And then you might want to use a lot of volume to really talk about something else. And people are like, wow, it's so captivating. Really, it's not that difficult when you practice. So vocal warm-ups, I swear by them. Mm, absolutely, for sure. What you're describing is the process of kinesthetics or learning by doing, learning by feeling. And singing and public speaking with an amplified animated voice can only, only happen when you put your voice into these, we'll call them abnormal or exotic positions for both art forms enough times that you can make a connection, make an association, then you build the motor skills and the muscle memory, and then it just becomes the thing that you do. So yeah, you're talking about kinesthetics and that's a big part of what the training and the content and the skills and the things that we work on are for. I love that. So if you were to say that there is one, I mean, like I know that, you know, in, in public speaking, we're, we're used to the Bueller, Bueller, very boring, very monotone. We know that that one sucks. What are some of the other ones that are really annoying as an audience member so that people can actually sit there right now and listen and go, oh yeah, I remember hearing someone like that. Because I don't think people are realizing that it's the sound of their, the person's voice that's mm -hmm. lulling them to sleep or annoying the crap out of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a really good question. Um, the sound colors that you previously described, the three colors, ha have sort of been studied, uh, not only in my, book, in my book, but in some other books. Um, that's, we call them physical vocal modes. Um, they have other names, and i can share it with you maybe perhaps another time. But you're on to something. Now, getting to other sound colors that are symptoms of vocal stuff that's going on inside that is not favorable would be mm -hmm. um there's numerous ones just off the top of my head one if said vocal fold compression i was talking about the ability to adduct or close the vocal folds efficiently is not built if you don't have that and it's very common a lot of people do that those that speak with a lot of wind might be an example also, those that speak with sort of a grind, sort of a sort of a grindy air in your voice like that, really unhealthy, and that's a symptom of not having healthy vocal full compression. So a grind, one, two, a windy, too much wind, too much of a windy sound color. Marilyn Monroe, too it's, airy. It's sexy in the right in the right moment, but in a TED talk, I'm not sure it's going to fly. <laughs> right. right? Um, and it is a symptom. See, here we go with your sound colors. The sound color of windiness to the trained ear gives me, it's full of, it gives me, the sound color gives me information. And what it tells me is, oh, your vocal folds are not compressing. We want to get your vocal folds to close so that you can speak with real tone, actually your tone and not hot, windy air. Okay. <laughs> so hot, windy air or grindiness are symptoms of vocal fold closure problems. Right. And there's another one. Sometimes people squeeze too hard on the vocal folds. And when you squeeze too hard, you get kind of quacky and quacky and shrill and you do this and that. And, and, and if it gets too quacky and shrill, I don't need to explain to anybody what that sounds like. Right? So if we have a client that is suffering from a little bit of um, their body, their, we call it the attractor state. It's sort of fancy voice lesson talk for physical habit. <laughs> the attractor state is to over squeeze and get shrill and quacky. Well, then we have techniques to help people sort of back off that compression and learn to relax. And when you relax the compression, 
in that particular situation, relax that compression, get rid of the, the, the quackiness and the shrill. You can add warmth, warmth to the sound color and then um, sort of more balance and it works better for everything you're trying to do. Yeah. So what about that nasal sound? When more air comes out of people's nose than their mouth. <laughs> well, um, nasality is sort of, sort of sounds similar to over compression of the vocal folds. And sometimes people misdiagnose over compression or quackiness on the vocal folds as nasality. That's not nasality. That is quacking. Okay. It's too much, too much compression. This is nasality where it's really up here in the nasal. Yeah. Just want to make, make a, di uh, uh, explain the difference between the two. It's sort of interesting. What about nasality? No problem. It's all in the tongue and the positioning of the larynx. Okay. So if somebody's a little, if you feel like, you know, your sound color is a little too nasally because you're resonating too much in your nas nasal, not a problem. We'll change those vowel colors a bit. We'll do some workouts and techniques that help them to feel through the kinesthetics resonance that is still has some nasality all human phonation speaking and singing have to have some nasal i mean it's an important resonator yeah the but air comes not, here but, and here yeah but not too much not too much right we don't want the predominance to be there um what do we do about it well you diagnose it and you do some techniques and you, and you get away and it's easy to fix do you most people is it dropping the larynx yeah. down too, like relaxing enough to kind of come down a little bit so it's not so much? Um, interesting. Kind of that. Um, to fix nasality, I wouldn't think so. But larynx, we call this larynx dampening. Larynx dampening maneuvers might be part of the solution for somebody that's quacking or squeezing too hard. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good solution, but it wouldn't really be for nasality. It'd be for quacking and compression. And so okay. that's one thing. That's what I might do. If I had somebody that came in that was squeezing too hard, I might have them do some things to get the larynx to sit down and relax a bit. Yeah, and I think that's something that I, until you actually put your fingers on your larynx and start to understand how to drop it down, it's really weird. Like people like, well, I don't know. I don't have that. And then you do it and you're like, oh, now I see it. And one of the ways that I was taught is if you hold down and you talk like Yogi Bear, it actually will drop it so you feel what it feels like. <laughs> Hello, hey, boo boo. It drops it down. <laughs> I love that we're, we're like playing with our throats and in video. And I know that those that can't see us on the podcast <laughs> have no idea, but it's really funny. You should watch the video. But I love that that's one of the, the ways that you can actually start for the first time, maybe even feeling you dropping it down because most people don't even know where it is, that they have it, that they can feel it, they can put their hand on it. So I think that's really awesome. So why don't, can you talk a little bit more about appropriate breathing? Because I think a lot of times, you know, you're talking about some people that are really airy. They're going to run out of air really quickly because I don't know how you can hold that air. But what are the breathing techniques you teach people to really start practicing so that they a don't run out of air and then like lose the end of the sentence because I hear that a lot. I'm like talking, hi, my name is Aaron Loman Jack, and you're just kind of throwing away the last piece because I have no hair left. So, what do you teach people about how to have enough air? Two things: one, get more air, and that happens by learning how to inhale more efficiently for singing and public speaking. It's not the casual passive inhalation and respiration that we do when we're just doing what we're doing right now or walking down the street. You're very much aware of it and you learn to um, breathe deep and low without raising the shoulders and the chest. There's a lot of core and oblique movement in good um, uh, singing and public speaking breathing. Okay, so just being aware of low, low and, and low and outside inhalations and 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 um expiring um and the other thing is which in the program in the course in the book there's six workouts that are involved different ways of holding the breath and doing the abcs or counting different things that i inherited from maestro kyle that are designed to build the endurance of your diaphragm and, and increase your lung capacity. I love that. So it's in there. Now, the other thing to um, the people are running out of air, well, if you have weak compression on the vocal folds, back to the vocal fold compression. 
issue. If your compression is weak, then what happens is too much respiration escapes through the glottis. So if you have weak vocal fold closure, the other issue I was referring to, one of the problems that that gives you is you're bleeding too much respiration. Too much respiration is, is, is escaping through the glottis and you run out of wind. Right. So as soon as you strengthen the motor skills to get better vocal fold compression, not only are you amplifying better and sounding better and more animated, but on top of all that, you're not running out of air. Yeah, because you're controlling the amount of air that's coming in and out. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so I always say, I always think about this. I always put my hands on my belly and I blow up a balloon in my stomach, right? Okay. Not the up the shoulders and try to fill up your lungs. It's really from the bottom up. And then speak when your tummy is coming back in, when the air mm -hmm. is coming out. And you have a lot more air than you think you do. And so really feeling that up. And some, some ways that I had to learn how to do this because I, okay, as women, I'm just say, we're wearing Spanx underneath some of these outfits. So we're trying to like hide and conceal. But the thing is, when you're actually speaking properly, your belly is actually extended because you have more air in there. So stop trying to hide it. Just yeah. own it and yeah. breathe properly because your communication is more important than your belly fat. Let's be honest, right? Well, of course. <laughs> of, of course. Of course. Um, so you know, th this is the breathing exercises um, in my book. And there's an accompanying video that goes with it. The six of them right here. Um, yeah, breathing super important. I like this idea, something to fixate on, I think, that is interesting, again, to the compression. If you get better vocal fold compression, you get three benefits in one. If that's not, I hope that's coming through for the audience if they're getting this. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer losing running out of air. That's great. And I've got real tone amplifying my upper vocal track. And, I'm, and I can, now I've got like real formant energy, real resonant energy that I can move and manipulate. I love it. All right. So yeah. I always love to ask, what uh -oh. is a tip or a hack that you think could help speakers, A, get on bigger stages, more stages, whatever that is for you? Like, what was it that you started to really amplify your reach out in the world on getting on more stages? Mm, um, from a practical perspective, there's partnerships and, and sponsors and other voice coaches that are part of my team. So I guess in some sense, partnering with companies that are interested in what you're doing and also working with a team of certified instructors. Um, um, not everybody has that. So something, some, or, or quick access to that. So another thing you can do that I recommend is get in front of a camera. Get in front of a camera. If, if you have a nice camera, great. These days, you really don't need one. Just use your iPhone and start making videos of yourself speaking. Find a topic to talk about and practice being able to, to um, talk about the topic, teach a lesson in one take without mm. stuttering and stopping. Um, right. And I've done thousands of hours of that. It's, there's, you know been a thousand videos recorded for the program and then I have a big YouTube channel and things like that. And it just, after you do it for a while, it's, you get good at it. Yeah. And uh, then when you get out into a public stage situation, it's just like being in front of a camera. At least it is for me. So if you don't immediately have that opportunity, get in front of a camera, make videos. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, right now, live video is what's selling. So Facebook Live, Instagram Stories, uh, YouTube channel, do the YouTube Live. <coughs> All of those things are so important and, and right at your hand, right? You could be speaking to thousands. How many people do you have in your Facebook profile? I have like, I don't know, 4,500, right? So how could every day I be speaking in front of 4,500 people? I'm going to get better and I'm going to learn to, to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I know a lot of people hate listening to their own videos or watching their own videos. Mm. What advice would you give them about listening back to themselves? And because I know the way that we hear our own voice and the way that it comes out of a speaker sounds totally different and it's hard for people to realize what's really going on for them. 
That's for sure. Um, that, that's a good question. Two things. One, um, most people in my experience of teaching singers and public speakers for about 15 years, most people think that they sound bad or worse or more goofy than they actually do. Very rarely are they accurate when they criticize themselves. And I think that the list, your listeners, listeners that are listening to this, you need to own that and hold that dear or that close. If you think you sound really awful and you sound terrible, it's most likely it's not nearly as bad as you think it is. Part of that attitude or that response comes from um, fear of the unknown. So when you, when you see yourself on camera and you're hearing the color, the sound color of your voice through a microphone or through a PA system um, or, or, or in my studio in a different uh, uh, amplified environment, it's new. It's different. And add to that, it even feels a little new and different sometimes because you're on different pitches and things. And when people, are, when people are, don't really know for sure if it's right or not, when there's a little bit of confusion on a subconscious level, fear play, begins to manifest and, and fear can take different, different forms. And one of the forms of fear for speaking and hearing ourselves is, I don't like it. It's not good. I don't like it. And right. so just be aware of that. Just simply be aware of that and stop it. Two, the other thing is, is train, practice. Do the things that I'm advocating in my book, in my course that Aaron and I are working on, get in front of a camera. And the better you get, the more confidence you build and the more truly real your improvement is. Make sense? Just, just yeah. put your face to the wind, face your fears, get over yourself and do the hard work. And slowly, just like anything in life, slowly but surely it starts getting a little better and, that, and you'll come to a point where like... Yeah, you know, that's, I'm proud of that. That was okay. That's better. That's good. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, the other fear is being okay. judged about your voice, right? Okay. I mean, you're thinking in your head, oh my gosh, I sound terrible. People are going to hate this, right? So the fear also comes from the psychology piece of, I'm so afraid to share my voice because people are going to judge me. And guess what? They're going to judge you no matter what. <laughs> and so you have to let that go. You have to just know that if you're out there making a difference in the world, people are not going to like you. Not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone likes me. And it's okay because they're just not your people. And you'll reject the people that aren't supposed to be your people, right? They're not your tribe. They're not your clients. They're not the people you want to work with anyway. So don't worry about them. Only worry about the people that you do want to attract. Those people will love your voice and love your message and won't care how they you think you sound. And I've heard that a lot of- Good point. Uh, Famous singers can't stand the sound of their own voice. They don't like to listen or even famous actresses and actors don't go to their own premieres because they don't like to watch themselves. Do you agree that sometimes singers don't even like the sound of their voice? Well, sure. Singers do this for sure. But typically it's something that beginners do mostly. People with experience don't really do that anymore. People with experience, if you have experience and you're still coming back to me, you're getting good. Yeah, right. All right. So one of the main tips today is find someone that can help you uh, definitely learn what's going on in your voice. And if you have no clue what we're even talking about, you definitely need to hire a vocal coach so that you can kind of get an idea of how to take your, what you have and really make it amazing, how to make it captivating and compelling and yeah. Get people excited about what you're doing. And, and go ahead. listeners need to understand real important point here. You're not what you feel every day in your speech mode, what you how you speak is not the only thing you can do with your voice. And you have to it might be hard to believe because you've never felt anything else. And it's so it's like walking and breathing. It's not the only thing you can do. Singers don't sing with the spe in speech mode. That's not what singers are doing. It's entirely the same system, but it's an entirely different radical set of muscle movements and vowels and same for public speakers. So just know that if you don't like what you're doing, it can be changed. I can do it. I can pretty much guarantee you. Just get in front of me. 
Yeah. So I always talk about when fear does come up, because we're talking about fear. When fear does come up, I always say that I like to go back and I I borrow confidence from my future self to step into the next unknown that I don't know, my next big goal, my next big step. And so if you were to have your future self in front of you, what would he tell you about what you're doing right now? About what I'm doing right now, my future self. Hmm. I think my future self would, I thought about this question. In some sense, I think my future self would say, Robert, more or less, keep doing what you're doing now. Not certain things that you were doing before, but, what, but as of July 27th, 2018, stay on that path. It's a little, little bit of a window to my personal life and stuff. I've kind of got my oh, my bleep together a little bit more than from the past. And I think really, you know, I mean, speaking with you, Aaron, and meeting you and working with you is part of that new path. And I think the person, the, and the, the me of the future would look back and go, yeah, reaching out to Aaron and, and introducing yourself and working with Aaron to find an opportunity to help public speakers was a really good idea. Keep doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I like your future self. He's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. How can how can the listeners find out more about you, your programs, your book? Tell us some some places for them to go. Okay. Well, my flagship website is at thevocaliststudio.com. One singer, thevocaliststudio.com. If you click purchase, you see a drop down menu and you'll see some options there course book lesson and that's the way you can get in touch with me with the course and the book and we can work on your public speaking so that would be one way to just get to the program and get running on this um, I'm also available um, on the same website give me a phone call or send me an email awesome thank yeah. you so much I Really appreciate you being here and sharing all of your knowledge. I am excited to learn more from you as you are from me. So it's going to be an amazing ride because there's just so much that we can do and we can help more people. I mean, one of my goals is to help a million people serve a million people in this world so that we really can shift and change the paradigms of this planet. And your voice and your message is really important. So thank you so much, Robert. I appreciate you being here today. And I want to thank everyone else. Thank you for listening and tuning in. This is the la- the episode before we get to some more good stuff about really digging into your content and speaking. So tune in next week and we'll find out more about content of your speaking. Thanks so much for tuning in. <laughs>